institutions to make sure that states behave within the European public order according to the convention. They can complain about everything it wants with regard to another state without necessarily having its own national state by having it. No. So that, this is not about a remedy, this is about ensuring European human rights standards on a general, broad level. Now, at the same time, we have seen that uh, the cases are very <coughs> uh, the cases are those that involve large uh, political issues, Ireland and UK in terms of the IRA terrorism, uh, <coughs> Turkish cases, cases against Greece when Greece had the military dictatorship. So this is big political issues. Uh, what is interesting are perhaps the cases painting, and again, at least one of them, Ukraine versus Russia, is, is also a case study and, and an example of the, what's the court for. Uh, Ukraine has thought it necessary to bring an interstate complaint against the Russian Federation, alleging uh, widespread violations of the convention committed by the Russian incursion of allegedly Russian troops or Russian supported troops in the territory of Ukraine as an interstate complaint, as a violation of the European Public Order of Human Rights, without specifying what the violation is. The violation is an international law infringement of the territory, but the convention terms uh, a breach of the European Public Order that is being brought to the court without specifying what kind of violation there is. Ukraine has also asked about interim measures, and we'll talk about interim measures in a moment. That is, essentially, the court, Ukraine asked the court to ask <coughs> the Russian Federation to stop the military operation. Now that's lovely, isn't it? Uh, how impressed will Russia be? Uh, just one question. What happens if, if I want to, to put a demand or a, or a petition against NATO, for example? Not, as, not to a conflict, you said like against Russia in this case. But what happens if I want to accuse NATO, for example, for inviting my country? Yeah. The, uh, court will shake your hand and say go home. <laughs> uh, Bankovic case, of course, um, was that case in question where uh, in the Kosovo War, in the Balkan Wars, NATO states um, bombarded the television uh, station <coughs> of uh, Serbian Federation in Belgrade. And uh, uh, claimants asked the court to accept that case which was brought against NATO. Uh, and the court said two things. One was you cannot bring a case against NATO because NATO is not a treaty member of the convention. It's not a member state. Hence the importance of the European Union accession. Yeah? But NATO cannot be a treaty member. But, of course, NATO acts through its members, so you can bring individual claims against NATO member states. That you can do. But the question will then be a burden of proof to say who took the decision within the structure to do certain things. Was it a command structure in NATO that was so autonomous that it cannot be attributed to any state? Or was it the decision of a particular state or state so that it can be attributed? Yeah. The, the answer is, is, is no. In that case, the court also said there is no jurisdiction because it's sort of <coughs> the, 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 the jurisdictional framework of, of, of Article 1 for the way it was conducted. But in terms of, uh, of uh, the state, it was just a good other cases um, in, for example, we come to, to, to Bosnia, to Kosovo, on complaints against behavior of UN mandated peacekeeping groups, in which the court similarly had the problem to assign uh, the truth. There was, uh, there was uh, uh, a situation where mines were laid in, in Kosovo, and after the war, children played with these mines and, and, and uh, were, were killed and, and, and injured. Uh, and the question is, whose duty was it to um, to take these mines and put them away? Was it the duty of K4 as the institution mandated to uphold security there? Um, which again would mean that it was the Security Council's duty, because the Security Council has mandated K4 to deal with that situation. So was the Security Council the violator, to which the court said it doesn't work? Or was it individual states? In that situation, the court was even more problematic because it was also not really individual states, because there was no proof who it was. So in between. You end up with a rather dreadful situation that could be nobody. You have these cases and these problems. Um, 
Ukraine in Russia has also led to more than 140, 40, 50 individual applications already, with more than 100 interim measures being granted by the, by the court. So the question is, of course, is Ukraine and are Ukrainian applicants on the right track to use the court for that purpose? What's the, what does Russia seek, what does Ukraine seek to achieve by an interstate application? If you were the Ukrainian government, would you send an interstate application to the European Court of Human Rights? Yes. Why? <laughs> I think they are like in the same line, I think they will receive really easy and because of the okay. <laughs> Like I said, politically talking, I think it's easy for them to, to go to the to European Court. And of course, in this in, in this line, I think it's really easy for the European Court to say something against the other side. I mean, yeah, I, I, I agree with the first part of that, certainly. Um, the argument is, in a way, it, it doesn't do any harm. <laughs> it doesn't cost much, so you send an application. Which is not a very strong argument. Um, the other argument is to say that's politics by other means. You're not so much concerned about the violation of the convention, about the effects, but you want to use all fora that you have available to bring to the attention of the international community that you think that Ukraine and Russia is wrong, Russia is in violation of the law. And you would do that in different formats. You would try to convince the Security Council to say that there is a violation of the territory integrity of Ukraine. Okay. The Security Council resolution. You might, as happens, the case, as, as happens in this case, alert the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe to send observers to deal with it as a matter of security and cooperation, and that's as a breach, as it is, of fundamental norms of the OEC. Helsinki Charter, Charter of Paris, and other documents which say borders are available in Europe, you know, security debate. If you use the European Union, in a much more difficult way, by arguing this is a matter of European integration, but we need to discuss it in terms of politics, political union, and economic requirements. Or you add in a fourth layer and say it's also a human rights issue. It's a human rights issue in two both. It's a violation of the conventions, the foundational value of the continent, which Russia seems to be in breach. The question is, of course, what do you want the court to say? In light of what the court has said in the other case, it's, it's, it's a bit difficult. I mean, you said the court will find it easy to say something. I'm not sure if the court will find it easy. That's a big one. Whatever the court says is, becomes highly political. It's no longer just the convention of conventional rights. When the court says that, essentially it says Russia is breaching its, 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 its obligations. It's even more problematic if you, if you look at the situation in Crimea, where you have a full-blown annexation very different legal statements. So the court is getting involved in the legal discussion way beyond the European Convention. Strong yeah. I mean, it's complicated because, like, I hear, like, the, the presidents, they say something against against Russia in this case. They actually say a lot of things. They say they are, that they are invading with Ukraine and stuff like that. Also, NATO, they say a lot of things about it. But it's complicated to me to understand what they actually say, but the court cannot say something because it's, po it's politically complicated. You know what I mean? They actually say it. I don't know what. Yeah. But the court, the, deal between it. the court would still have to say whether, for example, there is Russian troops on the territory of Ukraine to find a violation of, of, of the convention by Russia. Would the Human Rights Court be prepared to do this? Would the, would the court have the evidence? Um, would the court be able to go there and see what is going on? Russia would claim no troops in the Ukrainian territory. Ukraine would say all Russian troops. How does the court know what the court knows? What is the basis for its decision in that way? Would the court be willing then to go so far as to say the annexation of Crimea was an annexation of violation of international law? To which Russia would say, are we now talking about the European Convention or are we talking about the UN Charter? Make up your mind, court. I talk about the Convention, but nothing beyond that. So the court gets entangled in, in serious issues. That is how the convention was built in a way. The court as upholding public order in Europe and making sure that it's in line with democracy, rule of law, and human rights. But if you look at the details of the attack, how much power does the court have in that situation to provide an effective remedy? Very difficult. And what would the court argue in terms of effective remedy? 
relationship with Rolex groups, or any other possible remedies of what the court do. The same goes in a way for the question of individual application. Would you, as an applicant who is affected by the situation in, in eastern Ukraine, send an application to the, the European Court? And you can test all the criteria that we have just had. Are you a victim? Not unless you are not affected in one way or the other, which the victims usually are. So that's questions of liberty, security, death, torture, whatever, so the serious, the serious cases. But beyond that, you can't argue that you feel unstable and unsure in Eastern, in Eastern Ukraine because there are Russian troops. You have to prove, uh, you have to prove that. Uh, exhaustion of domestic remedies. I don't know how these cases work, but would you, in Donya, these days, have the chance to go to the highest constitutional court in Ukraine? And the court will apply the same principle as in the other Russian cases to say, no exhaustion of domestic remedies will be, will be checked there. You just send your application because we assume there is a war going on. Jurisdiction. Um, is Ukraine responsible for the events on its territory, as Russia would claim? Or is Russia in jurisdiction in certain parts of the Ukrainian territory? That is, does Russia exercise effective control over whatever the troops are there, Russian or Ukrainian or others, so that responsibility can be attributed to Russia and not to the Ukrainian government? Would the court be willing to follow its line of reasoning in cases that we have just seen, Iraq and elsewhere, that now part of Ukraine is actually really under the control of Russia? And was that what Ukraine actually wanted to achieve by the case? Admitting that it has lost control over its territory. While at the same time, for political purposes at home, we would never claim that it has lost any control anywhere, it's full control. And it's an armed conflict. It's not just a convention. If there is an internal armed conflict going on in eastern Ukraine, then the laws of war would apply. What would be the standards for the court to apply when there is a killing of a particular person? Would the court apply the standards of the convention, that is, peaceful situations which require police activity? Or would the court be prepared to say, well, there is war going on, so the way in which persons can be killed is governed by a different legal regime, and that is international humanitarian law, which the court has been very reluctant to do, because the court says, I can only speak of the convention. I cannot speak on matters of humanitarian law. I cannot speak on the Geneva Convention. Uh, so I would not be prepared to say in a situation of war there is any violation because it's not my competence. But that again would then mean that the court says whether or not there is an armed conflict. And that is not for the court to do. That is an assessment of the parties. And one might listen to the International Committee of the Red Cross. But is the International Human Rights is an, is the an international human rights court, the appropriate body, to say there is an international armed conflict in Eastern Ukraine? And if it were, what are the consequences? The, all, all of these issues flow from the idea that the court should be both, it should be an instrument of public review <coughs> and an individual remedy uh, with, with, uh, with the problems. And these cases are now coming to the court, and in the next years we'll see the answers, what the court decides, and how far the court is prepared to go to engage with, with all these issues. Interim measures. Would Russia follow the interim measure of Ukraine to say Russian troops have to go home? In reality, unlikely. There's other people saying that Russian troops should go home, Russian troops do not go home. So why should they follow the court? What does that mean? Do they then dismiss the court and the court's finding? Is it a disrespect for the court? Does it mean that Russia does not, in good faith, adhere to the European Convention system because it blatantly violates this in the situation? If that is the case, what should be the direction of the court in the country of Europe? Just say that is the case, that's the way it is, or take some kind of action. And who is the Council of Europe to take action? And what kind of action? <coughs> so, all of this is sort of comes together in a situation such as in crime, which is both individual applications and, and interstate applications. Uh, you can look at this when you get the files in more detail. That's again just to sum up what I've tried to say uh, in terms of the procedural part.